Good morning. Welcome to the Bank Rock Accelerator, Building the Metaverse City. We will be beginning the program in just one moment, beginning in just a moment. Testing, testing, testing. Good morning. 
Good morning. Good morning, everyone. This is the good, the good uh, portion of the class. You showed up and you're in your seats, smiling and ready to go. I've got the the uh, the other group out here <laughs> worried about their coffee and donuts or whatever, you know, everything else. Uh, they'll be in here shortly, so we're just giving them. There was a little bit of a line. We've got a big group uh, this morning, and it's it's uh, uh, really a, a, an incredible. Uh, audience we have, and we're going to get you involved uh, in this program, and that's probably going to be the best part of it, other than the couple gentlemen that I'm going to mention that are going to lead you through this discussion this morning. I think you're going to really, really enjoy them. Uh, I know that our team at Soyn City Innovation Partnership has really enjoyed working with these folks, and I'll introduce them in a minute. I'm not I'm, uh, drum roll, okay, we're not gonna, we're not gonna bring that out yet, but we've got some real firepower to put in front of you this morning on a incredible topic that can go a million different ways. Uh, again, we're just, uh, and I think we have a pretty large virtual uh, audience this morning as well, uh, from uh, not just nationally, but I think we have some global, some other people uh, globally from a few of the groups that we're working with. Um, so welcome, if they can hear me, I'm not sure yet if they, can they, okay. Well, welcome, welcome to our virtual audience as well. We're, we're so happy that you're uh, able to connect with us this morning. We had a, uh, and people that don't know, I'm Chris Bowen. I, uh, I'm a utility player here at Rhythm. Uh, I do what, you know, whatever, has to be done, and my big, my best uh, role in my job is working with the community and working with people that show up here. And you never know who's going to show up here. Um, you're in a uh, a facility right now that, fortunately, my patrons, uh, Rick Burdoff and RD Management out of New York, um, contributed. To Soaring City Innovation Partnership, it's another contribution. This is a big one. This is a major facility that um, we're going to upgrade. We're going to expand. We're going to do all sorts of things uh, over the coming months and years. But this is our essentially our garage uh, in our tech village. This is this is where a who's who shows up with everybody who wants who, who wants to come and and, and play and uh, be mentored to mentor. To, you know, just to really, to the, the heart of it is to learn about what it means to have the entrepreneurial spirit and what you can do with that, where that can take you. Because we really believe that if you think like an entrepreneur, you can go anywhere. You can, you can take your dreams and your visions and those of your friends and family and your neighborhood, and you can go anywhere. You can go anywhere, but don't go alone. Because if you notice, most entrepreneurs don't go alone. Sometimes they start alone in their basement, or uh, this is Florida, so that would be not a good thing. Uh, so don't advise that, but they'll start in their garage. They might start in their attic. They might start out in their yard, wherever they can. Entrepreneurs are very innovative. They're very uh, creative. and. Um, but then uh, very quickly, they multiply. If they're really good entrepreneurs, they, they multiply quickly. They've got more than themselves in that garage. But it all starts with the passion inside. But then taking that passion and telling that story to the world. That's the part we need to teach our young people and everyone really, that, that if you can think it, you can do it, but you have to tell it. You know, you have to tell that story, and it's really important to you. Even if you're walking along the street, walking along the path, just start talking about it. Now, my kids um, were picked up a couple times by the local authorities because they were talking to, they thought they were talking to themselves, but I really, I said, that's okay, keep doing it. And 
And sure enough, I got picked up. <laughs> right. So uh, I think we're about ready. What, what's it looking like out out here? Are we. I want to get I want to get everybody in here. Okay. All right. Enough of me. Welcome to Rhythm. Welcome to Soaring Cities, or Soaring City. God, I came up with the name. I should be able to say it. Soaring City Innovation Partnerships Black Box Accelerator. We had a great event last night. It was our inaugural event. It was a community event. It was the first of millions that we're going to do here, literally. But it was it showed that this this place is a special resource for our community and and to connect with all of our partners in the community and make this available as a as a, a gathering place um, to then go out and and do whatever you're doing, business startup, organization startup, community development, whatever it is. Because our community is used to coming here to this location. They've been coming here for almost a half century. They're comfortable here. They know they're safe here. Uh, they know they're welcome here. And so this is, this, we say this is an accelerator, and it is. But it's not just a tech accelerator. It's really a community accelerator. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean it's to help figure things out and get things done in our community and, and help people move ahead and move up. This is uptown for Pete's sake. You know, you got to go up in uptown. I didn't call it downtown. That's an inside joke, so I hope I didn't upset anyone. We are actually part of downtown. That's, that's the funny thing. Here in uptown, uptown is part of Tampa's downtown. We're here. This is downtown, right? We, went to some, we, we took Soaring City to Synapse a little while ago, a few weeks ago, and I said we're taking uptown downtown. And we did, and it was great. And I said, then I'm going to take some downtown. I'm going to bring more downtown up uptown. Okay, so this is a community accelerator, and we will do tech startups. We will do mainly entrepreneurship development and 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 uh, um, really uh, making entre building entrepreneurs right out of our our, our neighborhood and our community. Um, and we're gonna. Um, Today is our first really, I mean, we, we're, start, we're hitting it out of the park this morning because we're bringing two individuals that are playing at the highest top of the mountain. And, and, they're, meeting, and they're, they're working, most importantly, with others that are way at the top. But what you're going to see, and I think feel, in just a few minutes, is that these two gentlemen, while they are major league, beyond, and they're very well, very highly experienced, very well prepared and, and educated and all of that, but what you're also going to see is that they're two of the most genuine, just very good people. And that's really all we ask, you know, in, in working with everyone is let's start with good people, let's start with genuine, you know. Uh, uh, relationship. Let's start with a trusting relationship, and we can go anywhere from there. We can teach anything else. So, I'd like to introduce Roni Abovitz. Roni is uh, the Boston Consulting Group advisor. He's founder and CEO of Sun and Thunder, founder Magic Leap, and founder Mako Surgical. With Roni this morning is his colleague, uh, Guy Gilland, who is managing director and senior partner of Boston Consulting Group. Guy, yeah. I've, I've said already too much, so <laughs> you take it. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Does this work? Tracy, I'm having a little difficulty with the clicker. There we go. All right, so this is Ronnie. Hopefully you all can see Ronnie. Ronnie, you can hear me. It's a pleasure to be with you all this morning. We've been working with Chris 
and his team for several months now preparing for today. It's been really interesting learning about the area, what you all hope to do. Ronnie's in Fort Lauderdale, I'm in, in Dallas, Texas, but I also have a place in Boca Grande and my in-laws are from Lakeland, so this is kind of a little bit local for me um, and it's great to be here. Ronnie and I are gonna talk about something that he and I have a lot of passion about, right? So you, I think you'll see that. We'll have time for questions. We want, want to, to give, uh, give you time to ask questions. Maybe do a little bit of brainstorming about what all of what we're gonna talk about may mean for you. Um, a little bit, well, there we go. So a little bit about BCG. Um, I've been with BCG for 23 years. What, the reason this is important is it gives us a perspective of what's going on in the world. We are a global firm. Our second office was in Tokyo back in 1963. Uh, we have over 95 offices around the world, about 22,000 consultants, and we work in every industry. So we work in consumer goods, in energy. I'm in our technology and media and telecom practice. Um, what this gives us is a vista to see what other people are doing. You know, we work with CEOs, boards on a lot of different topics. I've worked with every major telecom company in North America over that, that time period. And what we'll talk about today and what's interesting is what are our clients, what are our, around the world, what are they doing with regard to the metaverse, which you've all heard about, and what are they doing about smart city, which we'll, we'll talk a lot about. We've done probably 100 projects around the world on smart city. We helped redesign the Singapore airport, as an example. And so we'll bring that perspective today in what we do, and hopefully this clicker works. There we go. Why are we here? I think it's always good to start with, as my clients say, a big, hairy, audacious, audacious goal. This is the BHAG, as, as they say. It's, what's your vision? You know, and, and we see this with a lot of our clients when we've done work in smart cities. It's, not about the mundane aspects of your geography, right? The length and width and square, square footage, square miles. It's about your vision. What do you wanna be? And I think this quote is, is quite powerful. It illustrates you can do far more than uh, what you may feel like a constraint in your area is. And so I challenge you, what's your vision? We, we got some ideas that Chris and the team and Ronnie and I have talked about with you all. It'd be great to get your input. I think one of the things that we see with the metaverse is it's a bit of a clean slate and a lot of people are trying to define what they are, what they're doing. And we see a lot of activity in that regard. So you all are kind of on the leading, leading edge of this curve as you think about you know, how you take the, the Uptown Innovation Corps and do something uh, audacious with it. Like I said, this is, this is a topic that a lot of people are looking at. There's, these are some of the smart city examples, and, we'll, and Ronnie will talk about one in particular that uh, he and I both have a, a bit of experience with. But this is, if you look at it, a lot of people are talking about this. We've done, as I looked at kind of what my coll collective colleagues and, and uh, I have done around the world, I had to sift through an amount an immense amount of material on benchmarking. We did, we've did. we done benchmarking on innovation districts and you'll see a little bit of that. We've done probably a dozen of those around the world. Um, done some benchmarking on cultural innovation centers. In fact, Roni and I did a pitch for the Dubai 2020 Expo, which is a big cultural uh, event. Got cut a little bit short because of COVID. Um, and then just the general concept of what's a smart city and what does that mean? And what we want to do is talk a little bit about the themes that come out of this work. What are the themes that we, we can distill from specific projects? And this is just uh, a, a subset of some of them that we've done. I think there's, there's six things that we see and one common element. So what we see city leaders as they define their vision and their aspiration, 
they've really arrived at one of these six goals. And this is interesting, as I worked with Chris and Mark and the team, is before we, we got to this, they said, we want to be the Resilient Innovation Center. Well, you know, they must have been quite perspicacious. And you know, we see six themes as we work with clients on smart innovation cities. Do you want to make a livable city, a digital city, an innovation city, a resilient city, which can mean lots of things. Um, so, and I think there's some unique things that you all could do in setting a, a vision. Socially empowered city, and a lot we're seeing on sustainability. In fact, that's one of our macro pushes as a, as a firm, is helping everyone benefit society through sustainability in, in the practices that you do. So we see across all the work that we've done around the world, these are kind of the themes that we see. Just so happens you all picked two of them, which I thought was quite interesting. So this is, I think, a view of what could you be and what do you aspire to be. If we, as we look at different um, clients, you know, businesses, large businesses, in addition to cities, they do many of the similar things. They're thinking about how do you become more digital. It's amazing how manual some things are. I'll give you a, just an example. I worked with AT&T. Um, AT&T was one of my clients, and we did some work for their head of network. They were building 100,000 cell towers to serve their mobile network, and they were building circuits to those 100,000 cell towers to offload data. They didn't know where 60,000 of them were. Physically, they didn't know where they were. They had 600,000 backhaul circuits. 40,000 of them were orphans at a value of a half a billion dollars. So there's a real opportunity for everybody to become more digital. And that's a telecom company. You'd think they'd be really digital. So this is, I think, a real opportunity for everybody. And the question is, why would you do it? What, what's the benefit? And we'll talk a, a bit about that. An example, this is some work that we've done in Singapore, autonomous taxis, if you will. You know, they're leveraging technology to create a real service. In this case, it's an interesting little taxi that goes on a pre-programmed route. You can book it with a mobile app, just like an Uber. You get in, in, in the taxi, it goes at a modest speed on a pre-programmed route, and it leverages technology to project on the screen different aspects of what you're seeing and it's about helping the community. It's just one example of leveraging technology, and that's the, I think that's the, the underlying theme we see in, in all that we do. One subset of the kind of work that we see is when people talk about creating an innovation district. Um, these are some benchmarks, about a, a, a 10 or so benchmarks that we've worked on in Barcelona, in Hong Kong um, and in different parts around the world. I didn't do all this work, my colleagues did. And, and one of the things that we see across all the innovation districts is leveraging digitization and leveraging technology, right? Technology is the underlying aspect across everything. Cultural, you know, if you look at the work that Roni and I were, were, were doing with the Dubai Expo, it was all based on the technology of Roni's company, which we, we didn't mention. Do you, are you all familiar with Magic Leap? Okay. So it's a, it, I think at the time it was the world's largest tech startup. Um, it was really amazing technology. And so that's how Roni and I met. So technology is the theme that we have. And I think that tees up something uh, with, with you all about what can you do with technology and for what purpose. And it just so happens, I think, as we're working with our clients, we're at an inflection point in technology where there is a new generation of technology and they're gonna be winners and losers, just like when the inflection point happened between the mainframe and client server, and then we moved to mobile, then we moved to IoT devices. We're at that next inflection point. People call it the metaverse, call it web 3.0, and that's what, that's what we wanna talk a, a bit about. 
Ronnie, you want to talk about kind of the, the prototypical example? This is Neom. Who's heard of Neom? A few of you. Ronnie? The camera on your head that you can't hear. Ronnie, we can't hear you. Can we turn up his volume? Hello? Just one second, Ronnie. Testing. Try now. Can you hear me okay? Hello? Try one more time. Can you hear okay? Test? I can hear you, but you're really faint. Can you hear me okay? Testing. Testing. Hello? Hello, test, test. Testing one, test. Hello. He can't hear me. So Neil, Ronnie, go ahead. Hello, can you hear? Yes.
the China with Urbiware. So this is an example of Intel. Um, I knew the old CEO of Intel, Bob Swan, but th this has now gone unnoticed with them. Right? They come in and said, this is huge. NVIDIA has said the same thing. They're putting their money behind their mouth. They're building a new plant in Ohio and planning on spending $20 billion on the plant. They just announced another one last week uh, in Berlin where they're going to spend another $19 billion. So they see this as a step function increase in their business, and it's going to drive a lot of demand for them. And what's this going to do? It's going to create jobs like crazy in Ohio, right? Who would have thought, I have a background in semiconductor, who would have thought Ohio would be a place where you'd build a semiconductor plant? We're all in Phoenix, New York, Austin, and California, and, and Dallas, or Texas Instruments. They're not in Ohio. But they, they're building one. It's going to really rejuvenate that economy with that, uh, the number of high-tech jobs that will come from, from this path. It's going to be unbelievable. And it's created all kinds of uh, other benefits for, for uh, the local community. So it's not going to notice, and people are putting their money where their mouth is in a big way, and this is one example. some of their articles on Metaverse, you might think it's like a 1990s video game with only wearing virtual reality headsets or selling virtual real estate. The, the new dynamite here is that this concept is much more pervasive. It's really the fairly radical evolution of all forms of the internet computing. Parts of it are pervasive already in our everyday lives, things like Google Maps, Google Earth, where you're combined with physical and digital and spatial locations. Every subscription is always on and highly connected with super speed, gigabit networks, 5G, LAN. It will also be very real and pragmatic, uh, not the sci-fi concept. Um, and it will, it will drive a significant, sometimes unnoticed value uh, uh, toward the engine behind fully functioning economies. And it has real potential to improve B2B and to augment sort of the lives of, of everyday people. Next slide, please. Just a quick couple of comments before we go. How many of you all know about that little puppet on the screen? Okay, so that was just an example of an early, early example of something that they had. You know, there, there was a, a lady in Berlin who got very active in tech after she became a real estate developer in the virtual world. She was making $400,000 a year doing that. Now, that didn't last. And we all know kind of some of the limitations. I think technology has improved. And one question we often get is, why now? Why, why the metaverse now? Why not 10 years ago, 20 years ago? Why not 20 years in the future? And I think our belief is that technology has evolved, and if technology is only as good as its weakest link, that it's evolved to the point where we can do some really interesting things, like creating AI avatars that can do real things. I would also say one other thing, just to give you an analog. How much of the metaverse is going to be avatars and virtual reality and things like that? My view is that that's a tiny part of it. And the analog I use is if you look at the robotics market, it's a $42 billion market today. How much of that is a humanoid robot? It's like 8%. Right? So most robotics are not humanoid. They're little shuttles in a warehouse that do advanced things. I think the same is true in the metaverse. The metaverse is, some, some of it is about avatars, and gaming is a good early leap in that. But a lot of it, particularly on the B2B side, is much broader than that. Tony? So one of the ways to think about how it relates to campus or going city vision, uh, this idea of a future digital city that's resilient, Think about uh, metaverse concept as a very instrumented world event in and of itself.
instrumented. The number of sensors that are out there has gotten, has exploded because the sensors have gotten cheaper because the capability of the semiconductor players. So there are billions, hundreds of billions of sensors in the world. And then intelligence. The intelligence of AI and machine learning has been, become really quite powerful. In fact, we have uh, a big part of our business is doing what we call AI at scale, helping every industry trying to understand how do you make the call center more intelligent. And that's the deploying AI bots with different call centers. And it's real today. So this is all happening. Here's probably the maybe most important take home idea for all of you about why this will be very relevant to Tampa and the solar and city future. Reality is constrained by the physical world. It's a finite economy. And, and to picture, think about like a bookstore in New York before Amazon. That bookstore could have sold a lot of books to a small neighborhood. Maybe they're really popular and they had reach across Manhattan or Brooklyn, wherever they were. Then along comes Jeff Bezos, creates the idea of this like digitally scalable bookstore. They're now worth close to two trillion dollars. They have global reach. They do things on what really are the roads and railroads of the metaverse. It's across the internet, and that internet is becoming spatial. So Bezos saw that the physical world is finite and constrained, but the digital world could be incredibly amplified. Think about the metaverse as an unconstrained digital universe that begins to interact with the physical and digital worlds in much more profound ways in the next 20 years than what's happened in the last 20. The value creation could be much more significant and the capabilities could be much more significant. So think about Tampa's economy and then multiply that by Tampa uh, embracing a suite of these technologies that think of all of them under this umbrella that in pop culture they call metaverse, but it's really a whole set of sophisticated technology, including communication and AI infrastructure, uh, gigabit networks. And think of how that could create an amplified and infinitely scalable economy. Next slide, please. So what is the metaverse? There's lots of people who talk about the definition. I think the most common thing you'll hear is it's avatars, it's gaming, it's virtual reality, that's all true. That's a very myopic view of what the metaverse is in our view and doesn't capture the potential of what businesses can do. I think the metaverse is really more about the data than the device, right? The device is important. The device is a window into the metaverse. And so we have clients, and I, I just wrapped up a project with a, with a telco client, doing work called creating the digital twin. What is the digital twin of their business? In a telecom network, it's pretty simple. It's their cell towers, it's their network, and it's the traffic on their network. And they're becoming more sophisticated about that. And the question is, how do they monetize it? And I'll give you an example where a telco failed in that, and what do they do about it? And in fact, there's several good examples. So I think, in our view, the definition is much more broad to the metaverse the important thing is it has to have an objective function. It has to be about augmenting humanity, making your life better. It has to be about improving our company, making them more profitable, creating new revenue streams, and from a sustainability perspective and broader, you know, enhancing society. That has to be the objective. And the way you do that is you get smarter, more interconnected, and more intelligent using the data of the digital twin through sophisticated tools to create value for people. That's what it's about. The best way to visualize it is actually on the next page. It's this. There are layers of data. In, in the, the physical world, you can't see it because there are only pictures are on top of it, but there's the physical world, and that's the bottom left picture, right? That's the maps of our streets and the buildings. It's dislocation. That's the finite economy. That's the economy we're all grounded in. Okay? But there are layers on top of that. There's the digital infrastructure layer. You can, that's, that's a good place. You can, you can actually fly over a city with, with a drone and take a LIDAR image of a city and create a digital image. All that, the, the Telco Tower Company actually are using drones to map all their towers. 
we're subsending the resolution. That's the state of the art today. So the banking industry, is all the utility layers about wood, water, power, food, food and all that. There's a services layer, the layer, layer of services that governments provide, law enforcement, health care, emergency responders, first responders, things like that. And then what we call the app layer, which is both consumer and business. The app layer could be entertainment, could be sports, it could be, you know, you go on vivid seats and buy a, a ticket to some sporting event, right? But it also includes enterprise applications, and we'll talk a bit about that. That's the big one, right? That's where the money's going to be made, and that's also what I think is going to drive a, a, a lot of needs around training and things like that. So in our view, the metaverse is a series of digital twin data connected by tools to create value. Okay, so the question is, what's a good example? There's a really good example of this today. If you go on, you all know the, the app Waze on your phone or Google Maps? You know how it works? It's taking street data. So it's taking the data, the, the data of the physical map of the street. It's taking data from the cell phone tower, the cell network. It's using an algorithm to compute congestion based on the speed of the cars going by those cell towers. And it's presenting that to you as the shortest route from point A to point B. Okay? So it's created real value. I was in a meeting with an executive at Verizon, and he said he lamented the fact they made no money off their data that was being used by Google Maps and Waze. So it's their data, and they didn't make any money off of it. Right? So it comes back to the point, what is the metaverse, and how do you win in the metaverse? It's create your data, monetize your data, create the linkages, the ways app that does the, the algorithm, present that to people, and also create tools. It was like the gold rush. The people who got rich in, rich in the gold rush were the people who sold shovels. Right? Th that's going to be true here as well. So this is our view of what the metaverse is. It's here today. It's not as powerful as it's going to be. It will get more powerful as technology evolves and, and gets rolled out. With all the fiber being deployed, it's unbelievable. And the infrastructure bill that was just passed Looks like they're going to spend $46 billion rolling out fiber to homes across the U.S. So it's happening. So we, we see that the metaverse is so much more than just an avatar and digital real estate. It's always on. It's pervasive connectivity. It's 360 contextualization, smart interactions. And if you leverage tools like the crypto world and blockchain, you can embed smart contracts into these interactions so that things happen automatically. It's going to drive dramatic improvement in productivity. It's going to amplify the economy. It's going to be quite powerful, and it's happening now. So Ronnie and I had, a, had a, an example where we tried, and we didn't talk about this, Ronnie, but uh, you'll remember this example. We were talking with the CEO of Walmart in Ronnie's office, and we were talking about how could this amplify retail sales, right? And how can we make retail happen outside of the physical brick and mortar store? So imagine you're wearing um, Magic Leap goggles, the augmented reality goggles, and you're walking down the street in New York City, and I see a gentleman with a sports coat that I like. Well, the augmented reality glasses could recognize that sport coat, do object recognition of where it came from, and I could purchase it just by speaking to the, the glasses. That could happen today. That technology exists today. So there's examples like that that can be quite powerful that can't, you can't do today. So ultimately, it has, and, and we have a couple of vignettes here. It has to create value for you. It has to create value for your constituents. And you need to think about that not just a brilliant made of some strategy. It's not about the technology. It's about what the technology enables you to do. And that ranges from improving the health and well-being of a society to environmental sustainability. At a meeting 
last week with the CEO of a crypto company um, who's based in Singapore and, and Shanghai. And he's thinking, how, how can he use his technology around the blockchain to make supply chains more sustainable and more efficient? There's real value there. And so it, it's happening. We've got, got a couple examples. This is um, an example of an enterprise. This, this is Walmart. Right? So we're thinking about what are all the use case examples that we could take to Walmart that could create value with the metaverse example, with augmented reality. And these are the, the more mundane ones. And Ronnie, you might speak to some of the more exciting ones. But the things around associate training. Doug, the CEO of Walmart, was in his office, in Ronnie's office, and he said, I have two million employees around the world. I've got to make them smarter. How do I do that? And he coined the term, I've got to Tony Stark my associate. If you've seen the, the, the Marvel comic movies, you've got a guy in a suit, and he's got somebody speak, Jarvis speaking to him that makes him smarter. It's a great example. It's a great example. And that, that's something you can do with the metaverse. You could provide the capability to recognize a customer to come in. Right? You can do amazing things. You can also improve the in-store experience. You can help people navigate the store better. If there's something missing, you can extend the shelf virtually so they can purchase something online and have a delivery. Doug was even talking about, and in fact they piloted, where they have in-home delivery, where you give one of their associates access to your home, and they record their interaction through a body cam in your home delivering groceries. And we're doing that in New Jersey. And then you can even get to more back office things like inventory management and merchandising. 